ladies and gentlemen, beg pardon, please pass those over to you over there. This is the Wilkesboro Zoning Board of Adjustment meeting of August 7th, 7 p.m. I'm gonna start the proceedings now. I'm opening the public session. My name is Mike Hodder. I'm vice chair of the board. I'm sitting in tonight with Brett Tedeschi, the chairman of the board who is away with his family out of town and can't be here tonight. So I'll introduce the other members and alternates of the board. Starting on my far right, Suzanne Ryan, an alternate member. Sarah Silk, a regular member. Mike Hodder, of course. Susan Razor, regular member. Dave Senecal, alternate member. And Tim Covington, a new alternate member. Gonna get his feet wet tonight. We have, in addition to one absence, we have one recusal. Hank Y, who is sitting in the audience, a regular member. So I need to appoint two alternates to fill out a five-person board. And if they're amenable, I'd like to appoint Dave Senecal and Tim Covington to the board to hear tonight's case. Okay, we have uh, one case to hear tonight, which the clerk will read out in a second. I'm just gonna go through the procedure in the packet and as part of the public record of this case, the rules of procedure for the Zoning Board of Adjustment will be followed as written. In substance, it will be this way, the applicant's agent will come up and make his case. The board will question the applicant's agent as he makes each individual point. When he's finished his presentation, those opposed, if there are any, to the application will have their chance. The applicant's agent will then have a chance to rebut and the proposed person in opposition, if any, will have a chance to rebut the applicant's rebuttal. After that, I will close the public hearing and this board will then proceed to its deliberations. We will deliberate, each member and each alternate will be allowed to deliberate, have his or her opinion on the matters of the case. At the close of the deliberations, the alternate members will essentially withdraw from further deliberations. I will call for a vote. I will call for any amendment to a motion made either to approve or disapprove with conditions or not. If that procedure is understandable, we will move on to open the public hearing. And I will ask the clerk, who is Susan Razor, to read the matters regarding the, uh, the, the case tonight, please. The matter before the ZBA is case number 7-7E-17 pertaining to tax, tax map number 203-626364 and 65. The applicant is the New Hampshire Boat Museum. This is a public hearing for a special exception under Article 17, Section 175-107 Echo of the Wolfboro Planning and Zoning Ordinance to allow for the construction and operation of a boat museum on property located in the Bay Street Limited Business, Dis Business District. This property is located at 57 and 59 Bay Street. A site visit was held at 6.35 p.m. prior to this meeting and was att attended by all the members present tonight. Notice of this meeting was provided to the appropriate town offices and to the Boat Museum, White Mountain Surveying and Engineering, Trifecta Properties of Wolfboro, Taylor Home, Costello, Gerber Living Trust, Diane All Smaldridge, or Smaldridge, Revocable Trust, Trulock Williams, and North County Soil Services. Okay, thank you. So if the applicant's agent, Jim, if you're ready to make your presentation, I'd ask you to um, make your opening statement, and then as you're prepared to go through the facts supporting your request one by one. At the end of each presentation of the A through H requirements, the board would then ask you questions, at which point when we're finished with our questions, we'll move on to the next requirement, rather than having you make the grand presentation and then us questioning you on all of the points that you've raised. Is that understood? Okay, thank you. I guess it's alive now. Uh, good evening. For the record, I'm Jim Rines from White Mountain Survey and Engineering. 
And I'm here representing the New Hampshire Boat Museum and their request for a special exception to construct a boat museum on their property. The property is uh, comprised of four existing lots of record, tax map 203, lot 62, 63, 64, and 65. The property is zoned in the Bay Street Limited Business District, and all told, the lots have approximately 314.4 feet of frontage on Bay Street and approximately 580 feet of water frontage by the, by the water uh, on Back Bay and total approximately four acres. The lots are served by municipal sewer and water. The proposal is to construct an 8,742 square foot museum, uh, which will require one space per 200 square feet or 44 parking spaces, which we have depicted uh, on the site plan here. Um, we've also proposed a gazebo and there will be a boathouse or boat houses. Um, those don't require a special exception, uh, but I just wanted the, the board to be aware. Um, after the submittal, uh, we had observed that uh, the, entrance, the plan that I submitted, and I'm going to turn it over. The plan that was submitted had two entrances, and both of those entrances fell on, a, uh, on the two utility poles for the primary power that goes down through. So consequently, we eliminated two into one. Which you see here, which is uh, just on the town side. Here's the Taylor uh, home entrance. And so it's on the town side. Stop you for a second. Do you have copies of that plan you could give to the members of the board tonight? I only had the, this full-size version to, so I, I, I can go on since it's for the use. I can present for, off of the. For the record, then that is the plan you're presenting. For the record, that is the plan we would prefer to present. Yes. That would be the plan that you present as part of the application to the planning department. Yes. Okay, thank you. So. Um, uh, additionally, there will be a scale replica of the Mount Washington as one of the displays, and that's shown in this location. Um, it will serve a as a display and also sort of a calling card uh, for the museum. And while we believe that this layout is an example of the final layout and suitable to dis demonstrate to the ZBA the intent of the museum so that the museum will know whether they can move forward with the permitted use, it could be revised due to, to address uh, permitting requirements at the town level, site plan, and at the state level. Uh, the project will require an alteration of terrain permit uh, because we are in the protected shoreland, uh, some of it, and uh, it will disturb uh, at least uh, 50,000 square feet in total, and at least one square foot of that will be in the protected shoreland. Therefore, it will trigger alteration of terrain, and it will also require a shoreland permit at the state level. Uh, Wetlands Bureau will permit will be required for uh, any boathouse or dock. Uh, at the town level, a town shoreland permit will be required, as well as site plan review and uh, a special use permit for any boathouses. Uh, we'll now go through the uh, criteria that is required to be addressed for the special exception. So the first uh, fact supporting the request is site suitability, that the specific site is an appropriate location for the proposed use or structure, and this includes adequate usable space, adequate access, and absence of environmental constraints such as floodplains, steep slopes, et cetera. So based on the layout which we have depicted on the zoning application before you, you can see that the site is suitable for the proposed use. It has adequate usable space and adequate access. 
The slope is a moderate slope averaging approximately 10% and there are no steep slopes. There are some jurisdictional wetlands present, but the team has been able to design a layout which avoids impact to any floodplains or wetlands. But as I noted, boathouses do require wetlands bureau approval. Is there any question for the applicant on the board on point number one? And none move on to number two. Okay, number two, the immediate neighborhood impact. Uh, that the proposal is not detrimental, injurious, obnoxious, or offensive to abutting properties in particular and to the neighborhood in general. Typical impacts uh, which extend beyond the proposed site include excessive trip generation, noise or vibration, dust, glare, or heat, smoke, fumes, gas, or odors, inappropriate hours of operation. So this proposal, as uh, this project as proposed, will not have any detrimental impact on the surrounding and neighboring properties. The museum will likely generate less traffic than the Taylor Home project directly across the street, but this use is compatible with other commercial uses along this portion of Bay Street. The only noise created as a result of this proposal will be vehicular noise from vehicles arriving and departing from the museum once the museum is constructed. Dust shall be a non-issue as access to the proposed property will be paved. The museum will not generate glare, heat, smoke, fumes, gas, or odors to the point of becoming injurious to the surrounding uh, areas. The hours of operation will be similar to the existing facility on Route 28, which is Monday through Saturday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., and Sundays, noon to 4. These hours of operation should not be considered inappropriate in our opinion. Questions from the board? Sarah? Yes, um, I have a question for you. Um, would this um, new site have the um, antique car and boat option that you have now in the spring? Well, summer. Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, there uh, is uh, w at least a one member on the committee here that may know, I, but... Uh, My concern is that you will be having, right now they have the boats and the antique cars that are for sale on the property surrounding the building they own now, and then when they have the event, they have the ability to have people park at the Nick and whatnot. And um, I don't see where they would put their overflow parking. When we just went out to look, I just parked on the edge of the road, and it was really inappropriate. And um, you moved your car so that I could put, pull it off the road. So I'm a little concerned about event parking at that particular spot. Um, I think that it, I, I don't know the process, but does that uh, particular event require an event permit from the town? I, I realize it isn't strictly excessive trip generation, but when you talk about excessive trip generation, it triggers in my mind any kind of massive traffic congestion. And so this event, I am certain, would because it gets a little congested where it is out of town. My, my, th my thinking. And, excuse me, let me oh. finish. And on the particular weekend I had uh, that they had it this year, I had uh, my hazardous waste was going on. They had the yard sale down at the Episcopal Church. They had the Nick Fest going on down at Booster Field. And they had Granite Kid Triathlon. And they had this boat sale. Well, the boat sale was somewhat removed from the center of town. And now it would not be. So I was just a little concerned about where you would put those cars because it's not appropriate on the side of the road there. Yeah, I, th I think my response would be that if, if if the museum learned that uh, if they were to have it there, this use would be denied, then I think they'd probably find a, 
another location for that one time annual event and if the board felt that that was necessary to put that kind of a condition on then i think the use is more important to the museum to uh, to be able to have the museum than for the event to occur on this space if that's a, you know a death knell i have one <coughs> if i may this is the Bolton, Bolton museum is going to continue to maintain the other property that they currently have correct uh, i don't know the answer to that question either Yes, I am, I am told by one of the members that yes, they are planning on still preserving their existing location. I don't think that the board is interested in making a condition of approval that there be no special events held at the site if this application is approved. I, I share Sarah's concerns. <clears throat> I think the board, other board members probably do also. A facility of this sort is coming into this neighborhood. We want to get a general idea of what sorts of activities, what sorts of use this special exception use would be put to. And that goes to special events, car sale, car and boat shows, whatever they might happen to be, any other special event that might be planned by the uh, facility. I'm just trying to get a sense of its impact on the neighborhood. And I think that goes to reason for Sarah's question there. Um, I, I was also concerned in this particular area, you, you state in your, in your um, testimony that the museum will likely generate less traffic than the Taylor Home Project directly across the street. That's an averral. Do you have any evidence for that? On what do you base that? Uh, excuse me. The uh, trip generation for uh, residential is typically 10 trip ends per unit. And so I simply looked at the, the number of units down there for that. I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't do an analysis, but that certainly would probably be something that gets addressed at the planning board level. And uh, so it was uh, you know, something that I took out of the ITE uh, trip generation manual from looking at that. Yeah, I, I, I think you can can rest assured that this board is very familiar with the sorts of requirements that are going to be dealt with on the planning by the planning board and the site plan approval process. But we do have a we're charged with a certain degree of concern and and authority to look into exactly the same sorts of issues that the planning board will be dealing with, but only not in as much detail as the planning board will be looking into them. So we're trying to get a sense of how much activity is going to be generated by this new facility if indeed this application is approved. Sarah. Um, just kind of segueing off what you were just saying, um, when you talk trip generation, trip generation from housing units at Taylor would be sporadic over the entire day and the thing with an event is all of those trips generated happen in a really confined period of time just before an event starts and just after an event ends. So it's it's a very congested type of trip generation as compared to people leaving from seven o'clock in the morning, say till 10 o'clock at night or something like that. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I looked at a museum. I didn't look at special events from a standpoint of that statement. Uh, you know, it, I, I think that I, I can tell you as a person who goes by the current museum on a pretty routine basis, I, s I don't think I've ever seen a vehicle come in or go out. Now I grant you when I go by, I have seen uh, at the special events, I've seen parking everywhere and you know, turning, you know, things going on. So um, I, you know, the, again, I would say that the uh, you know, special events, you know, the, the idea is for this to be the, the museum uh, special events or handle the special events permits. Yep. If this site isn't appropriate and they have their existing site where they've held them, I don't see any reason why that couldn't continue. Yeah, and agree. This this board, as every other board in town, has to rely on the expertise of other boards who have interlocking oversight responsibilities as well. Mm -hmm. Along the same lines as Sarah and Mike's comments, um, I see that you have a turnaround for buses, and I'm wondering how much. Um, how many tour groups 
come to the museum in buses, and is that expected to increase, and is it, is it, um, are there plans to offer that as some of these coach tours um, to actually go to the boat museum? And you may not know the answer to that, but I'm just wondering how much bus traffic, because right now there's no bus traffic on that road. Well, I think uh, obviously this facility is going to be su substantially uh, enhanced from the current facility, and this is the New Hampshire Boat Museum. Mm -hmm. So I think the hope would be that you know this would be a an asset to the you know the community and, and would draw people for, in. Yes. Uh, so that was the purpose of planning for it. I don't think there has been a uh, an analysis that says, gee, how many you know, bus trips could we generate, but it, it simply is size so that if, if it does start to become more of an attraction, uh, that it could, you know, a bus could be accommodated. Let me start that question. Can we address the site plan with you as well? Uh, Suzanne, sorry. You have um, 44 plus or minus parking spaces. You have 44 spaces on there, correct? So that's 44 cars. Yes, on a is. good day, there'll be 44 cars in there on a Saturday, Friday, the weekend, summers. There'll be 44 cars there, one would assume, at least once a day, if not multiple times a day, because you can only look around that museum for so long, and then you want to go get lunch, you want to go somewhere else, you want to, so you're looking at 44 times what? How many cars per day which would generate trips? I think your comparison to the Taylor home is a weak one at best. I think there's going to be a lot of traffic generated in that area equal trips. Yeah, I think, I think it's going to be incumbent upon the planning board to figure out exactly how to handle any potential traffic congestion, traffic flow along Bay Street. There, there are, I can think of a number of possible solutions to that problem, which would alleviate any impact on the residential portion of Bay Street and still survive in the center of the road. But again, that's getting into specifics, and, and I think, at least the way I see it, our responsibility here is not to, not to drill down into the specifics of, say, sewer hookups, but to accept your applicant statement in case to come in number four, that there is a, a town sewer hookup that sewer permit will be obtained and a hookup will be affected. Rather than drilling down, I think we need to exercise a general oversight here. I'm simply, I simply trying to recognize 44 Agreed. spaces times multiple ins and outs. What, what and, and I'm wondering, has the town planner talked to David Ford about this? Well. Just trying to get a sense because we do address trip generation. That is, that is. Yeah, and this use doesn't even exist. I understand that. Sure. Yeah, um, the other thing I would be a little cautious about is, is assurances that they were going to keep another piece of property because this is a nonprofit. If they, um, you know, had overruns on their building or something, they might find a necessity for selling that other piece. I don't think we can lock them into never selling the other piece, so we have to judge what they do now, which is they do have special fundraising events and all like the boat and auto auction, and I, I don't see that there's really any way that we could lock them into never having one here. Oh, agree. agree. I don't think we have that ability, so I think we have to, you know, Put it well, into I, our I thought was, process. I was thinking in terms of which, which, of how to, if the planning board wanted to do that, how, where to direct traffic to go up Bay Street, turn into the museum, go around and go back down Bay Street to Barney and ask for the main road as opposed to going up 109E and then right and going on to 28 Chatsua. Something like that, but that's, that's neither here nor there, and that's not really part of this. If we're finished with number two, can we move on to number three? Was that agreeable to the board? Okay, uh, number three, that there will be no undue nuisance or serious hazard to pedestrian or vehicular traffic, including the location and design of access ways uh, off the street and off-street parking. 
and this proposed use is not anticipated to have any undue nuisance or present any serious hazard to pedestrian or vehicular traffic. The access from Bay Street is at the crest of a hill with acceptable sight distances and suitably sized to handle both passenger vehicle and an occasional bus. Sidewalks and pedestrian walkways have been designed to separate pedestrians from vehicles and this site has been designed to provide adequate parking and compliance with the zoning ordinance. Question from the board. How did you arrive at 44 space? Uh, the zoning ordinance requires for museums one space for every uh, 200 square feet of gross floor area, so that came out to 43 and change, so we rounded to 44. Yeah, um, <clears throat> your statement, the access from Bay Street uh, is, has accessible sight distance and suitability to handle passenger and vehicle. That part, I assume you've calculated mathematically for the bus to make the turn while traffic's coming and going. I'm giving Correct. you that assumption. However, you have not addressed factually why it will be safe for pedestrians. I don't even know, there isn't even a walkway there. Um, uh, on Bay Street, there's bits and pieces of walkway but you haven't technically substantiated how this is gonna be safe for pedestrians with the charter buses, the 44 parking spots. I think you've got a ways to go to prove that it's safe to pedestrians. You, it's your job to prove it to us, not our job to prove it to you. Suzanne, if, if I may, I think what he's referring to, and correct me if I'm wrong, the internal layout the museum itself, there are guardrails, parking curbs, and sidewalks inside the space. I don't think one is refer the applicant is referring to He's already two persons walking up and down on Bay Street. I think he's talking about persons walking inside the property boundaries. Is that correct? That, yeah, that is correct. I mean, if, if the, the fact that there's suitable sight distance, if, if a pedestrian is walking on Bay Street, by having suitable sight distance, it, this, I guess, my point is, this is no less safe than the current condition. Um, if, you know, sidewalks are put on Bay Street, then that would be factored into the design. Um, but w we have addressed it on site uh, with curbing and sidewalks to, to separate the two. Well, um, that's a privilege to interpret his his presentation as such that he's only talking about on site. Um, however, I prefer not to interpret it that way. It says that there will be no undue nuisance or serious hazards to pedestrians or vehicle traffic. We're, we're, I think this board is limited only to testimony. The testimony from the applicant is as stated. I think we should move on. Matt, you had a question? Um, I don't, I know to the, to the east, it is to the, to the top of the hill that's uh, further down. If you look on the plan here, I see you have it up. Let me just show you. Yeah, oops, excuse me. What brings that to my attention is tonight when we were leaving, there were two people walking dogs, and there was no sidewalk for them to walk on. So when you're looking at the impact of this proposal, it's going to be not good. <laughs> Well, maybe, maybe when it gets to the planning board, because they can impose 
criteria, maybe they would uh, suggest that the developer puts in a sidewalk because they can make them do street improvements. Um, can I ask Matt a question? Yes. Isn't that one of the few streets in town that have the, I believe they call them sharrows, it's the bicycle share arrow thing there as well to add in with the vehicular traffic, the pedestrian traffic, we have the Shero for the bicycles. Okay, thank you. I remind the board the hours of operations of the CMGM are daylight hours, both winter and summer and spring time, 10 to 4. So at least there will be, most of the time, visible light and reasonable visibility. Well, we, were there, we were there at 6.30, so. Well, yeah, but, but I was thinking in terms of the winter time. Well, that's what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. Okay. Four o'clock was when they closed. Yeah, exactly, and I think that that's perfectly fine. If we finish with number three, can we move on to number I have four? One question. I'm oh, sorry, Tim. There's no there's no sidewalk provisions for you in this plan. Uh, there there aren't. Uh, but again, this is this is preliminary. You know, there's no other sidewalk, so it would be a sidewalk to nowhere. If if uh, oh, the no. the board is way to get people off the street. Right. Yeah. I mean, if if if, if there's a, a concern for sidewalks and certainly they can be provided. I believe it was the Mother's Day flood of like 2005 or six that that bridge went out and when that bridge was put back in, uh, Dave Seneca, I don't know if you remember it or not, if you were on the board yet, the, um, we, when we got the money to help do that bridge, there was a big to do about whether we were going to have the bridge widened to have a sidewalk on both sides or one side, and I believe the sidewalk ended up being on what was the true value side, not the Napa side of the street, if you know what I'm referring to. So there is sort of a predestined sidewalk location on one side of that street. Mm -hmm. And that's the side where the boat was it? Correct. It is, it is, Tim, yep except the businesses that were there didn't want it because it took away from their frontage. And, and their parking the lot. Can you go on to number four? Jim? Sure. Uh, availability of public services and facilities. That the following services and facilities are available and adequate to serve the needs and of the use designed and proposed. And they list examples such as sewer, water, storm drainage, fire protection, police protection, streets, parks, and schools. Uh, this structure will be serviced by municipal sewer and water, and this type of use is not a high user of, of water or a generator of sewage. There is ample room for stormwater drainage, which will be designed to meet both the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services alteration of terrain regulations as well as the Shoreland Protection Act requirements for this use. Uh, since the access is designed to accommodate bus traffic, the maneuvering area will be sufficient for fire trucks to gain access as well as for other police and emergency vehicles. Uh, given the size of the structure, I anticipate that sprinkling may be a requirement of the fire department, and if so, the building will be sprinklered as we go through the site plan review and building permit process. Uh, this use will have no negative impact on the parks or schools. Members of the board, questions? I thought this was fairly straightforward. Mm -hmm. Seeing none, number five. Okay, we're back on. Uh, you sound even better now. Yeah. <laughs> Appropriateness of the site uh, consideration shall be given to the following uh, parking scheme, traffic circulation, open space, fencing and screening, landscaping, signage, commercial vehicles, light impact. Uh, to address the site plan appropriateness, the parking, traffic, and open space have been designed in accordance with the Wolfboro Site Plan Review Regulations, and if the use is approved, the project will still be subject to site plan, uh, to planning board scrutiny. Landscaping, screening, and buffering will be compliant with the planning and zoning ordinances. 
There will be a sign that will be compliant with the Wolfboro sign ordinance, and the lighting will be color-corrected white lights with shield cutoffs and ground-directed, conforming to all zoning requirements. The boat museum will have a, a uh, single large boathouse or a couple of smaller boathouses as part of this project. Obviously, the fact that this is on Back Bay makes it ideally suited for this part of the boat museum. Question from the board? I have one. Um, uh, regarding the site on the plan, on the site plan, yeah, it's on that one too. Um, you have a proposed 12 foot wide paved driveway that goes nowhere, there's no turnaround, it just dead ends. What's the purpose of that and why doesn't it have a turnaround? Uh, it's simply for if there was some sort of emergency down on the, uh, on the boat, uh, on the water frontage, so a, like an ambulance could get down there or something. So it, it's gonna be, you know, hopefully an infrequent use and just would expect them to back up <laughs> rather than to, to create more impervious surface in the, in the waterfront. How long is it? And so, so they're going to have to back out? 130 feet. Out. They're going to have to back out? Yes. Well, the planning board might want to look at that, too. Um, the other question I had was, um, oh, shoot, I forgot. I'm sorry, I forgot. Quite all right. Um, I have one question. Deliveries, any idea of how many frequency of deliveries? And more importantly, where on the site plan, proposed site plan, will deliveries be made? Um, I'm not sure. Do you? I mean, I, do you have any sense, Rick? Mm -hmm. Impossible to say. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, I mean, it's UPS and FedEx. Uh, other than filling the boat, uh, filling the boat museum, uh, you know, this you can see on. on on this uh, perspective here, this is uh, probably the primary location to get boats in, which is here. So this would probably be the primary loading other than just deliveries for things that might be delivered similar to a residence. Yeah, I misunderstood in that case, and my apologies. I thought this, like other museums, was going to have some kind of food service attached to it restaurant or a snack bar and I was concerned about what sorts of delivery trucks might be coming up Bay Street to handle those sorts of deliveries but if that's not part of this plan then I had no concern. I, I, mean, I would think if there were events there they would be catered. I, I haven't seen a floor plan of the building at this point. You know, again, trying to, trying to get the use. Um, and anticipating deliveries by Cisco trucks. They're trying to currently park on Main Street or, you know, the, the three-quarter length semis, the half length semis. Um, Could you identify I, yourself, please? Could you come to the podium and identify yep. yourself, just for the record? Just give your name. Oh, my name is Rick Corian. Richard Corian, trustee um, at the Boat Museum. Okay, thank you. And, and as he just uh, testified, there's no plans for a museum, I mean for a, a restaurant or a snack bar or anything in, in the uh, museum. Okay, thank you. Um, even noting that it, there would be no Cisco trucks, UPS, FedEx, and oil trucks are notorious for parking in the street and not pulling into driveways. So. You know, I, I think, you know, you sort of have a good point. You were, you were thinking of other types of deliveries perhaps than I am, but I think there would still be deliveries and I would be concerned that they would not be pulling off into the driveway as they do not in most cases for businesses or private homes. Well, I, I <clears throat> certainly there's, there's ample room for them to do so. I, I unfortunately don't control the drivers and the people are creatures of habit who do what they will do. Um, all we can do is provide the space for them to do it if they don't use it. I, I, 
I don't know and what all to we say. have to do is realize that it's not a perfect world. Right. Are there other questions from the board on number five? Can I just ask a question on what's on the site plan here? No. Sure. I'm just cu curious. I, I think it's um, defunct, but your note number three and then your note above reference three easement, it talks about um, a said sewer easement. Um, it's for reference purpose only. So what becomes of that easement? Is that gonna become defunct when you join these lot lines? You're gonna so, write it out? So are you talking about, so right here is, is the sewer main that uh, passes through this property and that's going to remain. There was a, there is, I don't know if you're referring to this, this was the sewer connection that went to the house that was raised. So there will be a, you know, there's going to be a sewer connection from, from the museum and it's, I'm sure it's gonna use this stub here but it won't use this line, it will be a new line that ties in so nothing will be defunct. The old line will be abandoned. Okay. Yeah, I, I would suspect it will be removed as, ex, as the site work occurs. But the stub, I, I suspect, rather than creating a new tap into the existing sewer, we'll just use that existing tap. Okay, move on to number six. Okay. Right. Did, you, did you say you wanted to six? Okay. Immediate neighborhood integrity that the uses and established pa use patterns be weighed with the recent change trends in the neighborhood. So the established use patterns of Bay Street area are compatible with this use. Recent use patterns on Bay Street have include, include several marinas, a popular restaurant, numerous businesses, home occupations, and an elderly housing project. of the Bay Street Limited Business District, as defined in our ordinances, is, quote, to provide for a transition from the existing village core to a district providing professional, institutional, cultural, limited retail activity, mixed commercial, and residential uses. And that redefinition was in response to the, the design in the master plan, which called for the redefinition of the names of many of the zoning districts in town to reflect the current and anticipated uses mm -hmm. in those districts. Number seven, Jim. Uh, number seven is the impact on property values, that the proposed use will not cause or contribute to the decline in property values of adjacent properties. The proposed museum will be a landmark facility which will be attractive and a use that will enhance the Wolfboro and Back Bay community. The use is compatible with the general neighborhood and therefore will not contribute to the decline in property values of adjacent properties. Questions from the board? <coughs> Beg pardon, questions from the board? Um, I'm speaking personally, I do not think that there will be a decline in property values if this museum were approved by this board and was able to go through successfully site plan review. All the other requirements that are going to be placed upon it, I can only imagine that this would be a boon for the neighborhood. Number eight. And if I, if I could just touch on seven just for a second, I also, uh, before the meeting, I had a discussion with the neighbor uh, who's in here and he pointed out that, uh, you know, there's a concern from his standpoint that this, uh, it will, will block his view of, of the water. Um, and as I explained to him, this is, you know, it, it's uh, conceptual, we think this is it, but I, one of the things I had suggested that you know, maybe could be looked at is if this could be opposite hand. In other words, if the, if the barn, you know, something were switched, but I, I just point that out for the, that we've been made aware of a, of a concern since we're presenting this plan and I think he's here tonight, so we'll let him address that issue if yep. he wants to. If you could move on to number eight. Number eight, the proposed use or structure is consistent with the spirit of the ordinance and the intent of the master plan. 
and the, the zoning ordinance has been modified in recent years to create the Bay Street Limited Business District consistent with the master plan. Uh, since the zoning ordinance allows museums by special exception in the Bay Street Limited District, a business district, mm -hmm. this proposal meets the spirit and the intent of the master plan. I, I just want to have the question for something we discussed a second ago. Okay, hang on one second, Suzanne. You have okay. to your name to oh, I was I was just going to state that the um, definition of museum includes um, the institution for preservation, uh, ex exhibition of works of historical and significant value, and that. Our ordinance for special exception expressly permits museums. And so it, if all the other criteria applies, then we can't deny it. No, I, I, I take your point. I wanted just for the public to understand that. Okay, sure. Um, just clarification going back to the question about the sewer line. There is a four inch sewer line that goes up towards Bay Street that probably was the one that the house was connected to, but there is also an eight inch line. Correct. This, this, are you talking about this one here, Sarah? Yes. Yes, that's the sewer main. Right. So was, I guess, was your question about the easement for the eight inch line or were you talk, asking him about the four inch line? Okay. Yeah, I can. I mean, I, I can go over and read the notes, but there, there is, there is no, no change at all in the uh, uh, easement for the uh, main, sewer main. That, you know, as property owners, they don't have any right to change it. Only the town of Wolfboro can change that. Okay. Any other questions for the applicant? Seeing none. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak in favor of this application? Mr. Ballard. So, um, Jim Roulard for Olson Lane. <clears throat> um, just an observation, and that is, I think the complex will may reduce uh, the speeding on that road because. People use that, you know, as a way to avoid downtown. So I think activity there, I think from that regard, it would, um, it might diminish traffic or the speeding. Um, one other concern I had, if I may, I'm not sure if this is, is um, will the charter buses come down and then close to the, uh, is that with the parking lot? Uh, down close to the, oh, I see. Oh, so the buses won't remain there, or would they remain there? My concern was simply that um, we don't have an idling law in uh, in Wolf ordinance in Wolfboro, and sometimes the um, the buses that remain running down at Depot Square and so forth create a really terrible uh, stench. I'm hoping there's a letter to the editor about that issue at Clark Plaza or rather across the street. So I, I like the, and it's a beautiful design. I would urge you, Mr. Roulard, to attend the planning board site plan review should that this application get that far and make that concern sure. known. I would, I would share that with you. Is that this week? That'll be dependent upon whether this board approves this application. And that's unknown at this stage. Anybody else wishing to speak for the application? Okay, anyone speaking, wishing to speak against the application? Come up to the podium, identify yourself. Ken Gerber, uh, President 61 Bay Street. Um, first off, I am a supporter of the museum. Um, I think, you know, I do the uh, boat house tours and, you know, all the events. Uh, tonight's the first night I saw the plan, and uh, 
uh, I've got this sinking feeling in my stomach at the scale of this. Um, the you know 4,000 or 8,000 square feet, 44 parking spaces, um, just uh, is kind of um, kind of shocking me. At uh, you know this is a residential limited district uh, business district neighborhood. Um, it is quite substantial. Um, the the uh, notion of buses coming and going. You know, as was mentioned uh, by Suzanne Ryan, uh, lots of pedestrian traffic, people walking dogs, riding bicycles. Um, it's a very narrow road as it is already. Uh, I think buses, um, I, I can't imagine how that's going to, uh, to be safety-wise. Um, but I would like to, to go through some of the, uh, some of the exceptions and um, just give you my thoughts on them. The first one I think was, um, that it, it not be detrimental to the neighborhood uh, or the neighbors. Um, again, I think I, I talked about you know the increased traffic, the buses. Um, I think it's a safety issue. Um, I think the the scale of the initial the the museum uh, is not uh, fitting with um, the businesses that are that are currently on that street. I don't think there's any comparison to um, uh, some of the businesses that may have you know five six seven uh, uh, people at the business compared to 44 or more. Um, in terms of detrimental to neighbors, uh, as I am a neighbor, I'd like to backyard to looking at you know looking at the back of, of uh, fairly fairly tall uh, large uh, uh, buildings um, so I think it is detrimental to the neighbor namely me um, I think that's also one of the exceptions the impact to property values and uh, it was indicated that uh, that it would be positive to the property values I think you know maybe uh, I don't think it would be so for mine I believe that loss of the view the character of that that lot uh, it, itself, and, and I'd be happy to to bring the board uh, you know, on the property um, uh, at the site visit today. I didn't realize that uh, many of you were board members. Otherwise, I would have uh, invited you over to do that. Um, but um, it, it will completely change that property, and, and I believe uh, will definitely uh, drop the property value significantly. Um, I think, you know, the, the not judgmental or, or being a nuisance to the neighborhood, I think, uh, again, the, the size of it, the, the, the traffic, the 44 spaces, the buses, I, I believe that, uh, that that will be a nuisance. Um, as someone indicated, the buses sitting there idly running. I don't know if that uh, would be the case, but that would be, you know, right next to my house, right next to my backyard. Um, that certainly would be uh, detrimental and a nuisance. Um, so if, if the board uh, goes forward with this, I would ask for consideration of, of uh, something to be done in terms of maybe the scale, um, also in regards to uh, my property value impact with the, the loss of the view, if there is something that can be done with the, with the plan uh, and reversed or something like that to, to uh, restore some of the view that I, that I currently have today, I would appreciate that. Stay there for a second. <clears throat> Matt, question? Okay. Um, just one question for you, Mr. Gerber. How long have you lived at your location? Uh, we, we currently are uh, rehabbing the facility, uh, the, the house, so we are not moved in yet. Okay. But I've, I've owned it for um, a year and a half. Okay. Uh, any questions for the voter from the board? Suzanne? Um, one last question uh, to Jim. What's the. Uh, okay, hang on. Let's, before we go to Jim, let's. Well, I think it would help answer his, I'm um, looking to the elevations. We don't have the elevation of, what's the highest where the cupola is on the barn? It looks like to be the, uh, what the peak of the building is. What's, what's the elevation? 
because he's made a concern about the mules, so I'm wondering what the elevation is. Will you be applying for a height variance? No, so it's gonna be within the town height requirements, which are 35, 35 feet based on your preschool. So it'll be under 30, it would be 34. 34 and a half, 34 and seven eighths. It could be, but we don't know. We don't have an elevation. So he would have to come back if it's if it's over 34, uh, over 35. He'll have to come back for a variance. Yep. Is that? that so we all understand that carefully this is only for the use I understand that very well what I'm trying to put at ease the, is the applicant could very well be other occasions for the applicant to come before this board for other relief from other zoning <coughs> I was just trying to put at ease the abutter because we didn't have a height that maybe that's something he can live with he should have the right to know what it's going to be under at this time, because he hasn't come for a variance, at this time, it's under 35 feet. Do you understand? <coughs> oh, I totally understand that, okay. but just, just to reiterate, the, the last exception um, was um, impact to property values. Uh, I, I believe that that will be a negative mm -hmm. impact to my property value. Yeah. Well, just about the height thing here, we don't really have any realtor's opinion about how this might impact the neighbors because we have had no testimony on that tonight. Mr. Hart had an opinion, but we had no testimony about that. And when we were at the site review, it was expressed that this was a one-story building, and as soon as I saw the pictures, the, uh, the depictions of what could possibly be there, we can clearly see three stories worth of windows, and I realize that the lot is sloped, and one of those stories would be below the street level. However, I do have to harken back to a garage up by Robin Acres, and there was a lot of concern, and there was a denial because people thought they couldn't see over it. So it is something that we do have to look at. Sam. Yeah, just let me point out that on the plan here, this is not a story, that's a basement. Mm -hmm. By definition, a basement is part of the building that is that more than 50% of the foundation is covered by earth. So this is a basement. This is one story. There is no second story on this building. It's a single story building by definition, not two-story or three-story building. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, just also for the record, in the absence of realtor's opinion, personal experience, knowledge, and understanding of the neighborhood, and stated as such, is equivalent to expert testimony and can be accepted as a factual statement of whether or not property values are likely to be increased or decreased by approval of an application. Gerber? All set. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, th there was no intent to cut where it didn't need to uh, to cut. I mean, obviously, uh, the town zoning ordinance has a landscape screening and buffering ordinance um, to screen neighbors so that they can't see the, uh, or, or to minimize the impact, which runs contrary to, to uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Gerber's concern. But that's, uh, you know, that's part of site plan review. Um, so in, in terms of, uh, you know, the, Ironically, uh, you know, everyone probably in this room uh, knows that Brewster just went through uh, a similar concern where people who had no view easements were potentially going to lose their views. Uh, and I think it was Bob Hughes who stood up and testified that he had gone through the, uh, the um, 
assessment records for all of the properties on Clark Road that abutted that view and enjoyed that view, and none of them had an increase in their assessed value for the view. So I, I sympathize with Mr. Gerber that uh, if this property is developed, he's going to lose his view, and I think that now that as agent for the museum, we recognize his concern if we can uh, work with the architect and through site plan process to minimize that impact. I don't see any reason not to, um, but I, I, I think that it's, uh, it's something that we would try to do, but I, I don't know what more beyond that we could do. I think that's all this board can ask of the applicant at this stage in the absence of a city <laughs> worker. Okay, Thank uh, you. anybody else wishing to speak in opposition to the application? Seeing none, I'm going to close the public hearing and throw the deliberations open to the board. Members of the board, what is your pleasure? Did you want to go through each one, Mike? Yeah, I think we shall. I think it's probably the safest way to do it. And um, if you would like to go through them, why don't you start, Dave, with number one? Okay, number one, uh, site suitability. I think there's uh, adequate usable space. Certainly is not, I don't think he's anywhere near lot coverage uh, situation. There's adequate access. Uh, he's out of the floodplain at that, that level. No steep slopes. I would say that he uh, that he meets uh, number one. I would I would agree, and this also add that this lot, when it is finally gone through lot consolidation, is about four acres in size, and that's, in my opinion, more than adequate usable space. Are there any objections to Dave's finding? Uh, not an objection, but can I discuss this point? Um, you, you just referred to the lot mergers, and um, I think that are we, are we guaranteed that they're merging these lots? Because we heard them talk about the fact that on the plan, two boathouses are shown, which they, in order to get those, they would have to have the lot not merged at some point. So the adequate usable space, I think, is totally contingent upon that merging. And we have no way of forcing them to merge it. We know they have some intention of maybe not merging it right away. Um, that's that's an, an issue that, I'm, if I'm, it's not a digression, but it's, it's more of, of an observation that the board should be aware. Um, underlying this entire application are a series of maybes and what ifs. And maybes and what ifs are merger of all four lots, granting of various town permits granting of various state permits, potential applications to this board again for variances for site for um, impacts into the setback, and on and on we don't really know. So we need to be aware, and the, the design that we have been presented with tonight is not the one that they're going to build at the site if the, if the planning board says that's okay and gives them site plan review. This is all subject to change. Consequently, this board needs in some way to protect the decision that we make tonight if we decide to go ahead and approve this. We have to approve it with the understanding that if there are substantive, substantial changes to the plan as presented to us tonight, made by the planning board, made as a result of the zoning requirement, made as a result of a state permit denial or approval, it comes back for review. And when you say the plan presented to us tonight, you are talking about the plan he has up there now, not the one we had in our packet. The plan is presented. That's why I made the point in the beginning of the proceedings that that was the plan is presented. In addition to the statements made here, if, for example, he's unable to merge all lots and he can only come up with three lot mergers instead of four, then we may perhaps need to rethink adequate usable space. Mm -hmm may not be enough to put on a three-acre dot lot. So I, if this board decides to approve this application, I will have a condition to add to the five that the plan
Planner has presented, which will cover the eventuality, if potential eventuality, of this application going through some substantive changes by planning board or by state or town permitting processes would alter what we have seen tonight, <coughs> which will bring it right back to us again. It says right in here that it's valid for two years. Right. Well, yes, valid for two years. That's if understood. We approve, if we approve it. But if, if, but if we approve it and they come back through planning board site plan review with a radically different drawing of the buildings, parking facilities, it changes what we're seeing tonight. Or they come back with a design that doesn't have four lots, it only has three or say two. In other words, substantial changes. We are then required to review our <coughs> approval if we do that. And basically, it's a, it's a game starts all over again. And two years and or two years or not. Just, just to, to clarify what you're saying, I get it. I get it. What you're saying, but you, you use their words that they put on their application. If you approve this as depicted by the plan of 8-7, I, I, I believe that's what the date would be on this, 17 as presented tonight and supporting what you were saying. Yeah, basically. But I put, put a date to that plan because he didn't give us that plan. We only have this old plan of uh, 20. Agreed. So just, just slip that into your motion as depicted of the plan of 8-7. The plan was in the packet. Whatever that, what's the date on that plan? The new one, right? No. It's the old one. All right. Which one was that? July who? Entrance. 21st. Right. Okay. Right. See these? Okay. That's the poem. All right, let's move on. I don't want to take too much longer on this. Important. Number two. Any questions, concerns, comments on number two? I, I still have a concern about excessive trip generation in the way that the the number of trips were figured. But I perhaps share, it fits better on the number three. I share your concern with buses going up and down Bay Street, but I have to look at the ordinance and the way it is, has, was written, rewritten, and I have to also look at the special exception uses allowed by the Bay Street Limited Business District Ordinance, and they state specifically museums are allowed, and I have to assume that the planners at the time and the voters who approved that realize that museums generally get visited by people in buses, and the ramifications of these sorts of uses had to have been understood by the voters and by the planners. So I, I don't feel that use as described tonight is sufficient to violate number two in the excessive trip generation. And if everybody on the board would agree on that, we can move on to number three. I just, I just wanted to add that the hours of operation will, will mitigate that excessive trip generation. I mean, there might be a period of time during the limited hours that they're open where there's more traffic than other times of the day, but the hours that it um, is going to be open will, um, it's, it's not going to be around the clock um, bus traffic going up and down Bay Street. It would be only during certain hours of the day. And so I don't know that that would, could be defined as excessive. So I don't. I, I have a hard time coming up with what excessive actually means. It's a it's a difficult word to define to me, especially in terms of, of a use for of a museum. Uh, moving on to number three. Sarah, you had some concerns on number three. Yeah, I, I still have my, uh, a concern about the narrowness of the highway. And Matt said that the town is looking at, into that, but you know you have. Um, something that is being decided perhaps tonight and then you know we could just look at the center street project which started how many years ago and is yet to have a the first shovel dug so um i i think i still have some concerns about the sharrows the lack of sidewalks the narrowness of the road you know so i have a question for matt isn't it all covered under planning Board. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. You need to pull your mic. So I have a question for Matt. Isn't that all covered for the planning board to approve a, a project like this that it meets the requirements? It 
it's being it, yeah I, I think we also have to look at the, the they're asking us is this project if approved going to create undue nuisance or serious hazard to pedestrians and I propose to the board that serious hazard to pedestrian and vehicular traffic is not likely to be posed by this project by its nature it's going to be an intermittent use the buses are going to be large they'll be coming out of well marked driveways during daylight hours at the top of a hill with 100 foot plus sight distances in each direction i don't think that's likely to cause undue nuisance or pedestrian danger personally and I would add that the, um, the, the serious hazard, if it exists, it already exists. So the, the um, construction of this um, facility there does not create the serious hazard. It's already hazardous on um, Bay Street uh, as a pedestrian when there's a lot of traffic going up and down the street. So the, the project itself is not creating the serious hazard. I, I still, with all due respect, feel like it's contributing more of a possibility for a hazard, so. Okay. Uh, number four, any comments on number four? To me personally, um, this was the easiest of them all to find. There is town sewer, town water, there is fire and police. It is on a town street. Neither parks nor schools are applicable to this application because there's a, one park at the very end of the of Bay Street up by Elm. There is no school nearby. Stormwater drainage, they have four acres of land as adequate space for stormwater control measures. Anybody else on the board care to comment on number four? Moving on to number five, the appropriateness of the site plan. Anyone feel anything in a negative fashion towards this particular? Requirement. I would just say that I was encouraged to see that um, Jim was kind of responding to the to the abutters concern about well maybe the design could be reversed left and right to um, try to ameliorate the problem with the viewing and that's you know primarily planning board but it's brought up and if we t discuss it here I think it helps to put the planning board on notice that it's a point that it's important. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. Um, appropriateness of site plan, the plan is presented to us tonight, appears to me to be appropriate, but again, remember that the applicant has stated that this plan is not written in stone and is subject not only to change to site plan review, but also as a result of other zoning requirements and other permitting processes. So what we're looking at tonight may not necessarily survive all of the other review processes that it has to go through. And if that is the case and substantial changes are made to this plan, we will be required to review it one more time to be sure that it then meets our requirements. So we can, we can find the plan is presented appropriate, but with that proviso. Number six. Immediate neighborhood integrity. I don't have a, an opinion on this. I, I would point out in the beginning that A Street has changed a lot in the 30 some odd years I've been here. Um, great deal. And as changes are reflected in the new definition, the new creation of the Bay Street Limited Business District, and the new definition of what exactly is expected to be going on in that limited business district. There are businesses on Bay Street now that were not there when I first moved up here. And the entire length of Bay Street is becoming more and more a mixed use and less and less a thoroughly residential neighborhood. <coughs> Any other comments on number six? I'm seeing on number seven, impact on property values. As I said before, I'll, give, I'll throw my opinion in here, I'm not a realtor, but I have lived here for a while. I have seen changes on Bay Street, and in my opinion, I'll enter this as a fact to the record, 
there will be no diminution of property values as a result of the construction of this museum if this is approved through all of its various processes. And I suspect that there will be a general increase in property values along the length of Bay Street. This will be a much classier structure than many of the other structures that currently exist on Bay Street. Anyone else care to weigh in on number seven? I would just say I agree with the last part of your statement about it being a classier structure, but I still have concern about um, that view problem for the neighbors just as they had up at Brewster. And at Brewster, they solved the problem by paying 400000 and buying the woman's lot when they went to court. But, mm -hmm. you know, that doesn't happen every time. No, and, and I, I, I agree, and I share your concerns. I said at the time of the Brewster hearing when I sat on that as part of the planning board that I did wish that this town had a view shed ordinance in place which would protect people who enjoyed views. Um, we don't currently and we have no way of enforcing a view shed ordinance because we don't have one. Uh, it was heartening, however, to hear from the applicant's agent that he and his, his, his the person he's representing, the organization he's representing, are willing to listen to the butter's concerns Perhaps something can be worked out to mutual satisfaction, but we don't have the authority to deny on the basis of an obstruction of view because we don't have an ordinance on which to base that denial. No, we can only encourage the abutter if he feels that his view is no longer there to go down and seek an abatement on his taxes. Mike, I just wanted to add that I don't think that there's going to be a di diminishment in the um, the value of the, the residential properties, and I really believe that it's going to increase the value of the business properties um, because they'll, they'll be the businesses will be more visible to the people visiting the museum, and so it'll be a more desirable place for the businesses to be located. Okay, and number eight, proposed use or structure is consistent with the spirit of the ordinance and the intent. The master plan, I think, to my mind, that is clear in both the terms of the definition, the purpose of the Bay Street Limited Business District, and the intent of the master plan to create districts reflecting current and changing trends in use. Any other board member here to chime in on that? All right, then I guess we are at this point ready to make a motion to either approve or disapprove this application. I'd be happy to, Dave. I'll be glad to make a motion to approve the special exception for the New Hampshire Boat Museum, case number 7-SC17, as proposed to us on a plan dated tonight date. Yes, July, 21st. July 21st. Okay, plan dated July 21st. Um, and that also that they need to conform to any other town, state, or federal regulation. Um, uh, okay. I, I'll second it so we can get to discussion because I think we need to add something. We have a motion on the, on the table. Is there discussion on the motion? Yes, I think the motion is lacking um, any reference to Merging the four lots. Okay. Um, I, th I think I, I can cover that with a condition. Um, Dave? Or? Yep. Well, I, I thought we were dealing with the use and stuff of this particular property. And it's presented to us as tax map 203, 62, 63, 64, and 65. Correct. And that's how it is presented to us. It says nothing in the special exception requirement they have to be merged. And I, the reason I went with any other town, state, or federal regulations is when it gets to the planning board, it's probably going to be a requirement that these lots are going to get merged. That's what I would suspect. Okay, may, maybe I can continue on with this motion. Put a comma, Robin, after the end of Dave's motion. And then continue on with conditions one through five, shown on the Department of Planning and Development Memorandum, August 3, 2017, as part of the public record of these proceedings. And in addition, condition number six, 
ZBA will review its approval if conditions imposed upon the applicant by the planning board under site plan review authority substantially alter the plan for which this special exception has been approved. Yeah, I'm willing to add that. I'm sorry? I'm willing to add that to the motion. Did you get that, Robin? Okay, you have the language for that. Do I hear discussion on that condition first, and then we'll go to the full motion with all six conditions attached? I'm not sure how you are proposing that that would address the merger thing. Well, the, the plan as presented to us tonight goes shows four lots yet to be merged. Correct. They have Those, justified they're going to merge it, but the correct. plan doesn't exactly show that. Well, the, the, and you, the 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 just finish, and you stated very early in our review that for the site suitability that as four acres that you were very pleased that it was it met the adequate usable space. However, if the four lots were not merged, they would not satisfy that. So I, I think we need some kind of no. assurance that that is indeed going to happen. Well, or else we have to vote it down because it doesn't satisfy number one. Well, actually, we, we forget as far as satisfying number one, we can't say whether this is an appropriate use on three acres or two acres or one acre. We don't have that expertise. It's presented to us as a, as a plan on four acres. What we're approving is the plan in, in its entirety. That's the drawing that we see on the board. We have that dated in the motion to approve. Well, when you refer to it, would you feel comfortable saying the four acre plan? We have a survey plan. Mm, I don't think that's appropriate, but bear with me one second. Actually, if you read, if you read your survey box, lower right, you'll see that he's actually, that the plan is based upon a merger of those four lots. Those four lots are specifically identified in the survey box. I think that plan shows them merged. It says total acre. That plan up four there. Four Your acres. plan on the board show them merged or not merged? It shows, from what I can see. It Yeah, then, then, we're, then we're approving a plan of four acres. We don't need to require them to merge the plan because the plan is based upon a lot of four acres. And I'm happy if it's the plan and the plan clearly said four acres. Yeah, and, and it does exactly on there. So, Robin, would you read back the motion to approve? Don't bother reading conditions one through five, but read condition six. that meet with our planners approval I see some concern it's in, it's in the initial preamble yeah okay Robin would you read the introduction to the, the, the full motion and leave off the conditions because that's the only part that we haven't gotten into the record and that now we're all apparently in agreement on. No, that's fine. We're, does everybody understand the motion that they may or may not be voting on? All right, we have, we have a condition which we have not finalized in accepting. Uh, the condition that I 
voted on the motion, number six, had not yet been voted on, and then we'll do a vote on the entire motion with all six conditions attached. So do I hear a motion to approve the wording of condition number six as just recently read by Robin? I'll make that motion. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, now can I have a motion to approve the motion to approve with all six conditions as attached? I'll make the motion to approve the motion with the, the motion to approve with the amendment six attached. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. All right, let's see if we can deal with the minutes and get ourselves home at an appropriate time. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, where do we do that, before or after? After. Okay. Looking at the minutes of June... Uh, June 12th? No, June 5th. Beg pardon. Didn't have my spectacles on. Any changes required to the minutes of June 5th? I have none. Anyone else? Um, I just had on page 2, the third paragraph down, it says, Sarah Silk asked, relative to number 5, how long have the present owners have owned? That's obviously not correct. Um, I believe what I asked was how long had the present owners owned the property? And then on page five, just before consideration of minutes, it says further he noted the ZBA should seek and counsel's opinion. So that the end of that sentence is just a little confusing. Mm -hmm. Should seek counsel's opinion. Yeah, throughout the end. Okay. Unless there was something else they were supposed to seek. Okay. I think that was what was being referred to. Okay. So then I would make a motion to accept his amended. Hang on one second. Anybody else have any questions on the concerns of the minutes? Can you just clarify on the FIT update that it, um, the appeal is in Supreme Court, has been filed in su Supreme Court? It has been. But I mean, was that what was discussed then? I can't recall. We just discussed, as I remember, that there, an appeal had been filed to the Supreme Court. Um, it had not been given a docket number yet. Okay, so then, then this, further from then this the, is the good. lawyer. Is that correct? It was just Hank asked for an update on the FIT, and, and we gave him, and that's basically what we told him. Okay. Anything else on the minutes? Sarah, you had a motion on the floor to approve? As amended. Second I'll second that. Okay, so seconded by Susan. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Uh, new business, Sarah? Yes, um, let me just pass down one, two, three, four copies. What I have here is a flyer for Forgotten Farms, a documentary film on New England's dairy farmers. New England dairy farmers remain the backbone of the region's agricultural agriculture, but fight for survival in the age of baby beans and artichoke cheese. It's a free movie screening. Donations will be gratefully accepted, followed by questions and answers from the filmmaker and some of the farmers that are in the film. It is this coming Friday, August 11th at 7 p.m. at the Village Players Theater on Glendon Street, and it is being pre organized and presented by the Wolfboro Agriculture Commission with the support of New Hampshire Farm Bureau, the Wilder Farm, Top of the Hill Farm, No View Farm, Alicia's of Wolfboro Bed and Breakfast, Yellow Dog and Company, Barefoot Gardens, Kingswood Press, Bly Farm, and Bree Schuett. Um, I have seen this movie. We, um, some of the members of the Ag Commission went down to Portsmouth to the Music Hall and saw it. And um, it'll be very educational. I don't think people realize that in New England, especially at this time, like last year, the cost of feed was astronomical because of the drought. Plus, they have to pay retail for all of their feed. And um, then when they go to sell their products, it's not like the products at the farmer's market. When they go to sell milk wholesale, the wholesale price is set in Wisconsin, where they milk 400 cows an hour at the most of the dairies. The scale 
is just not relative at all to New Hampshire and New England dairies and the prices that they pay for their um, grain and everything else out there has nothing in common with what we pay in New England and I think it would be educational because when the towns look at zoning for agriculture and whatnot, I, I think that they need to keep some of these things in mind because family farms in New Hampshire are disappearing by the hundreds of acres every month because they can't afford to hang in there and the price of taxes, they can get some relief in some communities through conservation easements and removing the um, developmental rights, but it, it's really tough. And one of the farmers that was there was telling us a story after the uh, viewing, in fact, she'll be at, at this viewing, there'll be a little discussion period afterwards. They borrow equipment for the, making those huge round bales one little problem, $12,000 to repair the piece of equipment. We're talking, in, you know, they get nickeled and down by thousands of dollars and then they have no ability to up the pro-sale price of their product to help to cover all of these fluctuations and fixing equipment or even buying the things they need to buy just to keep their animals healthy. Any other new business to come before the board? And may I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Seconded. I'll second it. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed?